Alan Iverson with our Lindsay Zarniak. He's solidified. We all knew he was, but now he knows as well. Into the 2016 Basketball Hall of Fame, that class. Stephen A., you know him very well. You have a close relationship. What's his legacy now that he's a Hall of Famer? Um, arguably the greatest little warrior that ever played in NBA history. I mean, the greatness of Isaiah Thomas can never be questioned. National champion, two-time NBA champion, one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history. Uh, Nate Tiny Archibald speaks for itself. Um, you know, but when you think about Allen Iverson, you think about a, a miniature dynamo, six feet, 160 pounds, soaking wet, uh, playing amongst giants, and on more nights than not, he was the biggest giant of them all. I mean, he was oh, just a warrior of the highest order, never played with any fear whatsoever, was constantly in attack mode, believed in giving it to you and giving it to you in ways that sometimes would demoralize you and other times would embarrass you, um, and more importantly, doing it his way. That didn't always work for him, as he would readily admit. Mistakes were made along the way. Uh, he certainly wasn't flawless or perfect, no doubt about it, but considering where he came from, the obstacles that he had to overcome, the challenges uh, that he faced uh, to a point where uh, so many times in his life, uh, opportunities were there, uh, they didn't seem to be there. They weren't evident. Uh, it was a challenge for him to even envision the possibility that any of his dreams could come true, but he kept fighting, kept getting knocked down, kept getting back up. Uh, that's who he is, and that's who he's always been. Uh, there are times, you know, I know him, obviously, in ways that a lot of people don't. There, are there were times where, you know, there was the temptation to give up. There was the temptation to, to feel like life was over. Um, and the biggest challenge is, you know, when he separated from his wife. But it was beautiful uh, seeing him last night um, at the arena, uh, right before they went on midcourt, uh, you know, to introduce the Hall of Fame inductees for 2016 uh he was on the phone uh with 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 tawana the love of his life right before he walked up the steps to get on the court and i thought it was symbolic in a lot of different ways because uh you know it started in his eyes everything starts and ends with her and as long as he has her he's going to be all right um and so considering what he's been through and some of the personal trials and tribulations primarily self-inflicted no doubt that he went through for him to be at a point now where he's being recognized as a hall of famer and it's not like you got to remember there's a separation you got to be years removed from the game before you get inducted into the hall of fame uh his attitude was as long as i'm performing they can't deny me they can't deny me but he hasn't been performing and he's been away from the game for years and so to get the call and to, to get the announcement that you're going to be a hall of famer that's people remembering what he did. And Allen Iverson has always been the kind of guy that thought that no one would ever do that for him. But it couldn't be helped because his greatness was that great and it shined that much. And so I'm real, real happy for him. I didn't like his ad I didn't like his wardrobe. We're gonna talk about that mm. when I see him next time. We want to, we want, I want him to come to the Hall of Fame ceremony with a suit on. <laughs> but outside of that, uh, everything else, I, I, I'm, I can't put into words how happy I am for him. And Skip, you know, I've said this on many occasions, you know, I, I, I'm confident and, you know, I know what I can do and I know what I've done in my career. Uh, but having somebody like him to cover and him trusting me the way that he did, um, I truly believe in my heart of hearts, no matter how far I've climbed in my career, um, I wouldn't be here if it was not for him. Hmm. I really believe that. That's deep. I loved your expression that you used to describe him, greatest little warrior ever. I agree with that. I was always in awe of what Allen could do on a basketball court, mostly as a solo act. So in my days as columnist of the Chicago, excuse me, Chicago Tribune, when 76ers would come to Chicago, even if I weren't writing that night, I'm in press row because I just want to watch because I think I might see something I've never seen before. That's why I went to all those Michael Jordan games because I always saw something from Michael I'd never seen before. Every night I'd see one little thing and I'd say, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that before on a basketball court. Which brings me to my question that I'm gonna give back to you. Over my time covering the NBA, 
a number of black players around Allen's age have told me that they revered Allen Iverson in ways beyond even how they revered Michael Jordan. And, and I need your help to walk me through this because I can't see that. I'm the biggest Jordan fan, but for me, help me out here because to me, Iverson was more of a me player than a we player. It was more about him. I, I nicknamed him me, myself, and Iverson when he went to Denver with Carmelo, and he didn't like it and shot back at me, which is fine. But, but that's how I saw him. I saw his greatness. I saw his warrior um, mentality. I, he gave himself up on the court physically night after night, but, but I always thought it was a little more about him. I know they made it to that finals against the Lakers, and you predicted they'd win a game, and by God, they won a game, the Ty Lu game. So I, I get all that, but I need you to take me one level deeper and explain to me why so many black players, or maybe even the black community, put him on a pedestal that I don't quite get. Help me out. Well, I would tell you that <clears throat> to a lesser degree, the black community, even though it, it, it was applicable, but to a larger degree, the players, they did revere Mike uh, Iverson in different ways than Michael Jordan. When you looked at Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, if you remember, Skip, when he first came into the league, would wear the sweatsuit, the gold chains, and all of this other stuff. Um, and, you know, ultimately he graduated to a point where he was suited down and, you know, he was incredibly polished. He was more comfortable speaking in front of the camera. Uh, he had the representation of, uh, of the great David Falk. Uh, you know, the, the, the guy surrounded himself and insulated himself with a bevy of individual World Wide West and others always looking out for him. Charles Oakley, uh, that, that's like his brother. Charles Oakley would die for that man. Uh, when, when you look at the way he insulated himself, he was protected. So even though you had nothing but the greatest respect and reverence for Michael Jordan, not just because of his basketball skills, but because of how much of a global iconic figure he became. Uh, I mean, he's the, uh, when you think about being deified, you think about Muhammad Ali, you think about Michael Jordan, you think about Michael Jackson and on the, and, you know, on the music level and what have you. I mean, Mike, Michael Jordan was basketball's version of the Beatles, for crying out loud. It's just the black version. And yep. so when you looked at it from that perspective, you just looked at him at, at higher ground. Like he was above the fray. Allen Iverson was somebody that was considered to be in the fray. He was a guy that was incarcerated once upon a time. He was a guy that was raised by a single mother. And then he had his uncle, you know, pretty much like, like an uncle to him, Gary Moore, who loves him dearly. He, you know, he, he was insulated by a street crew of dudes. Uh, that's all they knew were the streets. And, and you know, where Allen Iverson came from, it was emblematic of all of that. And he was one of those individuals that wore that as a badge of honor, that wore himself proudly, that sent the message uh, to, to, to America and beyond, look, this is who I am, and I'm not going to change because to him, to change would be the equivalent of disassociating yourself from your own. And Allen Iverson didn't want to do that. Now, there are times that that's a mistake. Because even I've gotten on him about that. Just because you dress the part and you prepare yourself for corporate America when you go into corporate America or you dress for business when you're going to handle business does not mean you're selling your soul. It means you're adapting to the environment that you desire to ingratiate yourself in so you could get paid. That's not something he's ever quite grasped. His mentality has always been, if I were to do that, that's a roundabout way of disassociating myself from my own in a way, let's say for the sake of argument, Tiger Woods may have been accused of disassociating mm -hmm. himself from. And because of that, Allen Iverson considered that to be the ultimate crime. Because to him, it's not about elevating yourself to another stratosphere. The most important thing to him has always been about being able to go home, going back to Virginia, going back to Georgetown, going into any hood in the United States of America and being embraced by folks you relate to because you never forgot them and you never ignored or disassociated yourself from who you were and who they are just because you got paid and you were a star. To him, that has always been the most important thing, and it's primarily the reason that he's never changed. I think he has needed to adapt. 
I still think he needs to adapt to some degree, especially moving forward, not getting any younger anymore. But I also understand why he has always been religiously reluctant to do that. He is, it's all about being able to go home to him, being able to go into any hood and they can recognize that you love your own and you're not willing to compromise okay. yourself or change who you are for them. I got it. Trust me, I respect everything you just outlined for me and detailed. Obviously, I can't relate to it the way you can relate to it, but what we all share is what happens on a basketball court. So, so now bring it back to me from, if you will, the white guy perspective. When I would watch Allen at the highest level play in the finals, and Larry Brown's trying to coach him, and as you know, he didn't have a whole lot of help on that team. He, he just was such a solo act that it was the antithesis of everything you know I love about my San Antonio Spurs. They play basketball at the highest level with no ego, no stars, doesn't matter. If you got the hot hand, we'll feed you tonight. It, no, the, nobody cares who the high scorer is. Everybody gets their share. Everybody's going to touch the basketball. They're all about getting everybody involved. And too often, for my taste, Allen was just about, about Allen. It was AI all day and all night. And, and he was sensational. But when it came to the highest level of winning, I think it was more about me than we with Allen. That's just me. Well, it was it was it was all about him in a lot of respects, but it's 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 a disservice to him for anybody to just leave it like that. You have to touch on why it was that way. Allen Iverson's attitude was: Were you incarcerated? Were you giving you know uh, uh, concurrent sentences to be served for a, a, a bowling alley brawl yep. where you've proclaimed your innocence? Did you have people try to snatch your future away from you? Did you play at Georgetown and play for a coach in John Thompson who had to threaten NCAA officials and the school itself that we're not going to play this game unless those signs are taken down yep. with some stuff that we can't even repeat over the airwaves? Allen Iverson's mentality is, look at what I've been through, and y'all counted me out. Now I'm going to go on the court and prove you wrong. And not only did he try to do that, but he also highlighted, who am I playing for? Before we go, let me tell you a quick story here. Allen Iverson said this to me one day when Larry Brown was talking about how he wouldn't pass the ball. Allen Iverson, yo, Stephen A., how many seconds on the shot clock? I said 24. It takes about eight seconds to dribble it past half court in our offense, right? I said, yep. He said, I get a ball to Eric Snow. He gives it to George Lynch. He gives it to Tyrone Hill. You might give it to Nikembe. They get it back to me. It's five seconds left, left on the shot clock. Stephen A., evidently, they didn't want to shoot the ball, so what the hell you expect me to do? <laughs> and I was start laughing because I understand how simplistic that sounds, but it also made sense because it was primarily his career in Philadelphia. Run a relatively slow, archaic offense. Some guys might shoot, some guys might not. But then at the end of the day, here you go, AI, with the shot clock winding down. Please come and save the day for us. That's what he was talking about. And he said that was the story of his life. Because whether it was on a basketball court or on the streets of Virginia or beyond, everywhere he went, every place he's gone, that has always been the umbrella upon which his life and his career has evolved. Yep. I understand that. Fantastic conversation. You guys really went a level deeper. I feel like gained a lot of insight from that. Stephen A., thank you for uh, sharing your stories there. And congratulations, Alan Iverson, a Hall of Famer, and to uh, that his wife was there with him as well. We love to hear that. It was a thrilling ending in the NCAA tournament, but how much blame do the Tar Heels deserve for the loss? Skip, we wanted a great game yesterday. We certainly got it. That's next.